This episode of Because Science is sponsored by Archer 1999. All new episodes premiere May 29th on FXX. This is why you don't want the power of immortality. Superpowers usually only change how some hero or villain lives out the rest of their lives. Get super strength, for example, and you might spend the next 40 years or so lifting cars up off train tracks to save people and whatnot. And if you were to get super speed, you might spend the rest of your adult life zipping around the world doing your hero thing. That was good spaghetti, by the way. But what if your superpower didn't just change your life? It was life. Do you really want to live forever? 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 Of all the superpowers we've evaluated on this program, I think, interestingly enough, immortality might be one of the very oldest. For example, in the oldest surviving work of literature that humans have, the Epic of Gilgamesh, it's all about a quest for immortality. So obviously, we've been thinking about immortality for a long time, and theoretically, it does sound awesome. You'd finally have enough time to say, pick up the piano, I still have super strength, or aprender otra idioma. But if we think about this power scientifically, I'm not sure you would take this apparent bargain. Vamos a empasar! I still have super speed. First, how should we define immortality? Well, the simplest and most straightforward definition of immortality would be that if you are immortal, you are exempt from death. Why does it have to be so spooky? But this version of immortality, especially in pop culture, usually comes with other superpowers like invulnerability, which is a whole nother thing. So for this analysis, we are gonna instead focus on the most realistic version of immortality, biological immortality. Generally speaking, humans have three main causes of death, disease, aging, and physical trauma. And right now, without some radical advancement in medical technology, the only one of these causes that we can't really get around, protect ourselves from, or outright cure is aging. Biological immortality then would be the absence of aging, but susceptibility to the other two causes of death. In pop culture terms, this is your classic foot Highlander version of immortality, where you could theoretically live forever because you don't age, but you can still meet your end by other means. For your life, there can be only one. If you stopped aging, if anyone did, it would be incredibly transformative. As one of the biggest voices in life extension research and me in 30 years, Dr. Aubrey de Grey puts it, aging is essential for metabolism, but eventually that metabolism disrupts itself to death. As we age, our immune systems weaken our cells and our DNA in those cells accumulate damage and mutation, and our cells eventually stop dividing. Over time, we will succumb to the side effects of one of these disruptions, whether that be heart disease or cancer. In industrialized nations, around 90% of the average deaths per day in those nations can be traced back to age-related causes. If we were to end aging and become biologically immortal, it would radically change society, or at least with a superpower, change your life. Right now, though, our best efforts to extend the human life expectancy are just not fast enough to put us on the track towards immortality. For example, if you were to graph human life expectancy over time versus advancing technologies that extend that life expectancy, it takes longer than one year to make a technology that extends human life by one year. But if we could find some medicine or process or technology that extends human life expectancy so much in such a short amount of time that it outpaces how long it takes to research that advancement, we would hit what is called longevity escape velocity, where our lives over time could be continuously extended indefinitely. Biological immortality. And it sounds crazy now, maybe, but researchers like me from an alternate timeline think we can act actually hit this escape velocity. Hip. Even if humans never achieve biological immortality and stop aging, at least we know it's possible. You may have heard about this floaty boy in the news, Turoptopsis dorni, or the immortal jellyfish. This creature is theoretically immortal because it has the ability to turn its adult body back into a ball of undifferentiated cells and then back into the first stage of its life cycle. It's kind of like if you were able to turn yourself into a ball of goo, and then a baby to live your life again. The Hydra is another Highlander-style creature known for its amazing 
regenerative capabilities. Its cells also set it apart. They do not experience what's called senescence, or the eventual stoppage of cell division, giving it a potentially unlimited lifespan. Now, I've said theoretically and potentially very intentionally here, because both of these creatures can just be eaten. Even if you are biologically immortal, even if you're careful, it can be a big risk. And that's because in a life without end, all the untimely deaths will become timely for you, and they will happen to you a lot sooner than forever from now. A falling coconut? From where? From where? From where? Over the last 200 years or so, human life expectancy has doubled, which is amazing if you think about any other creature doing that in just a few generations. In the early 1800s, this advance in life expectancy was due to increases in sanitation, education, and housing, and more recently, vaccines and antibiotics have kept this trend on track. Now let's say in the near future, some scientist figures out the key to biological immortality and injects you with it and whatever's in that syringe could be its own episode, but for now, let's just say whatever it is, it makes you hit longevity escape velocity, and now you can blast past normal human life expectancy and age-related causes of death like Alzheimer's and cancer. Now you are biologically immortal, just like some pop culture makes it out to be, and your average life expectancy goes from around 71.5 to infinity. Or does it? If you were to eliminate aging, you would automatically eliminate some of the leading causes of death for the average human, leaving only less likely non-age-related causes of death like homicide and car accidents. On a long enough timeline, the survival rate of everyone drops to zero. Even if you were biologically immortal, eventually the unlikely ways to die would catch up with you, and sooner than you may think. Here is a simulation by data visualization website Polestats. What they wanted to figure out is how human life expectancy would change if you removed all of the natural age-related causes of death. So no heart disease, no cancer. Only ways to die would be getting struck by lightning, which is very unlikely, or falling off a ladder. The Polestat simulation is a good approximation of what we are talking about with pop culture inspired biological immortality. And what they found is that if you remove all these natural causes of death, leaving only the unlikely ones like biological immortality would, the human life expectancy jumps to around 9,000 years. Yes, living a hundred times longer would be extremely significant. I'm not arguing that. I'm arguing that this is not exactly immortality, is it? It's just eight to 9,000 years. And it also means that when you meet your end, it's gonna be through one of these unlikely ways and it is not gonna be pleasant. Yep. And I'm not just putting some weird check on biological immortality either. Nature does this too. For example, langosta do not experience cellular senescence. Their cells never stop dividing, and therefore they can theoretically be as reproductively fit as they want to forever and grow in size forever. And yet, when we look in the oceans, we do not see mega langosta everywhere. The largest that we found is about the mass of a toddler. A toddler with pinchers. They are still susceptible to disease and predation, and as they get larger, it takes more and more energy to molt their shells. Eventually, they run out of that energy and die in their shells. Any kind of realistic biological immortality will still be subjected to nature's checks and balances, and therefore cannot be true immortality, making this power kind of a, what? kind of a misnomer. Even underwater? Was that Aqua Sean Connery? Now, I know what many of you are probably thinking right now, but Kyle, even if realistic immortality isn't forever, I'd still take 9,000 years over my typical lifespan. Okay, sure. What I am saying is that even living this long is the biggest problem with this power. Let's say that we did conquer death. We figured out how to upload our minds to computers or we solved all of the big problems with cryonics. Now we have true, complete immortality. However, this still comes along with serious, life-changing existential problems. The biggest criticism that you'll hear is that if you are completely immortal, you will have to bear witness to every single person that you know, love, or care about passing away. You can always make new friends, you could even make a new family over time, but the idea of not being able to even share the supposed fruits of immortality is hard to accept.
And would there be a point to doing and seeing potentially everything if you're going to forget a lot of it? If you reduce the complexity of the human brain, potentially the most complicated thing in the universe, down to just its neurons and the connections between them, then a rudimentary estimate for how much storage space our brains can hold is around two and a half petabytes, or two and a half million gigabytes. This is a lot, but it is not infinite. And from behavioral studies, we know an important part of living life and experiencing and learning is forgetting. For example, after this video is over, you are probably gonna just forget the exact color of my shirt, but will hopefully remember something about what I said about immortality. The point is, is that your brain prioritizes some information and remembers it and deletes other information or forgets it. If one of the supposed benefits of immortality, complete immortality, is accumulating all the life experience that you couldn't get in just one normal human lifetime, then this is not evolved to to deal with unlimited experience if there is some finite amount that you can remember and then therefore you have to forget everything else. In one human lifetime, it doesn't matter if you forget your first birthday, but if you are immortal for all time necessarily and you forget something that you could have only learned with immortality, like La Otra Idioma 5,000 years ago, it is a serious, non-obvious endpoint to this supposed benefit. Magical complete immortality has huge quality of life problems too. For example, if you are living forever, your chances of contracting an incurable illness and being sick forever is 100%. Now, I'm not saying that people can't live while sick, but if you knew this was gonna happen if you became immortal, would you choose to become immortal? Yale philosopher Shelley Kagan argues in his book, Death, that immortality would also lead to extreme boredom. An infinite life necessarily exhausts all potential experience well before that life is over, leading to extreme boredom. And if you forget because of our brains or some magical reason so much of that life that you are never bored, what was the point of even having that experience in the first place? In Kagan's view, death is actually a rescue from the unbearable tedium of immortality. Oh, what's up, dude? Or just like, what if you fell into an abandoned mine shaft or an unbearable, uncaring void and you were stuck there for literally ever until the end of time and you just had to sit there all cramped? I can't even imagine how bad that would be. So, why don't you actually want the power of immortality, someone freed me from the mineshaft? Well, if you had a more realistic version of immortality, you wouldn't be truly immortal, and you'd be bound to die in some unlikely and very unpleasant way. And even if you were truly magically invulnerable and immortal, you'd have to deal with bigger philosophical and existential problems, like losing all of your loved ones, and your friends, and your family, and your memories, and your connections to society, and probably your will to live live. Mortality might be in and of itself a superpower from the point of view of an immortal person. Death may be what makes us feel alive. Because science. I'm stuck. Oh, I'm stuck. Oh, I'm stuck forever! There's a lot of other existential and quality of life problems that we didn't even get into with uh, complete magical immortality too. Like if you were living uh, forever, literally forever, just imagine how hard it would be for society to cope with you and for you to cope with society. Not only would you be the most famous person in the world and you'd probably be immediately dissected by someone, if you think music sucks now compared to what you liked when you were a kid, imagine how you're gonna feel in 20, uh, you know, uh, 2,500 year, as people say it. And you, it, what, what, what is this bleep blorp music? When I was a kid, I liked Pink Floyd. And now it's all, I don't know. Keep goop, keep goop. That's not music. Now that's what I call music, 2,500. Thanks again to Archer1999 and FXX for sponsoring today's episode. This season, Sterling Archer, Lana Kane, and their crew of acid tongue misfits are on board the MV Seamus salvage ship. An important question arises as they explore deep space and try to outsmart giant aliens, intergalactic pirates, and vicious bounty hunters. How will they survive each other? Welcome to the space-tastic world of Archer1999. New episodes of Archer1999 premiere May 29th on FXX. 
Thank you so much for watching, Mustafa. If you want more of me and want to suggest ideas for future episodes, you can follow me and Because Science here at these social media handles. Also, the full series of The Science of Mortal Kombat is up on the channel. I think you're going to enjoy it if you haven't seen it. Also, the very first episode of our spin-off show, Because Space, with Archer himself, H. John Benjamin, is now live. You're going to want to check it out with Dr. Moo. Wow, is it great, and am I jealous? Yes.